I want to talk about sex and I don't just want to talk about sex. I want to talk about good sex. So listen up. If you guys head over to bluechew.com, blue like the color blue, you'll find that they have the first chewable tablets with the same FDA approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. So you know they already work. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And since they're chewable, they work twice as fast as a pill. So you can be ready whenever that opportunity arises. Who wouldn't want to benefit from the extra boost of confidence? Who? Okay, Blue Chew is fast and it's an easy way to enhance your performance, okay? Blue Chew is prescribed online and it ships straight to your door in a discreet package. So there's no doctor's visits, there's no waiting in the pharmacy, and best of all, there's no awkwardness. There's no embarrassment here, okay? They're made in the U.S., they ship in the U.S., and they're cheaper than a pharmacy. So right now, though, we have this special deal for our U.S. listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free. And when you use our special promo code, WOW, just pay $5 in shipment. Again, it's BlueChew.com. B-L-U-E, Chew.com. The one thing that I believe would work everywhere is fighting. Because it doesn't matter what color you are, what country you come from, or what language you speak. We're all human beings and fighting's in our DNA, man. We get it and we like it. Hi, I'm Michael Morgan and welcome to this week's episode of The Wocast. Kindly powered by Middle Easy. Yes, we're back in the Middle Easy fold. More on them later. We're also sponsored by Prospect Apparel. Again, more on them later. G, as usual, joins me in the cockpit. How are you doing? How are you I'm this doing week? well. I'm great. How are you? I'm bad. I'm terrible. What? As you know, I just finished, well, it was yesterday. I finished 100 miles, London to Surrey and Surrey to London. That's 100 continuous miles. Okay, I stopped off for a break um, at least twice, but, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but my ass is killing me. No, I would not take that the wrong way, and your ass should be <laughs> killing you. I just, <laughs> I just, why would I? And congratulations to you, and it's all for a wonderful cause, which got me, which gets me so hyped, which is a wonderful thing, and salute to you. Well, it just sounds a bit weird. It's not the type of greeting that you'd expect from somebody. Yeah, my ass is killing me, but and right, and I'm like, that's cool, bro. Right, <laughs> 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 but it should be to ride that long. I'm sure your butt does hurt. Did you have a nice meal afterwards? I'm like your mom. Did you eat afterwards? You know, you, know, you see, this is I have to say the bit of the podcast where I have to fess up and admit what an idiot I was. I raised um, over. Fourteen hundred dollars um, oh, nice. for Bipolar UK, which is a charity. Basically, um, they're based in central London, and they support those who are going through um, mental health issues, and specifically around bipolar. Now, I thought that it would be a really good idea. I don't know. Maybe I was influenced by Dick Whittington or something to have a really nice spread whilst I was. Uh, doing the ride so I thought you know I'd stop off and I'd have you know something to eat so what did I do I packed a bag full of food I had pizza bread I had garlic pizza oh, bread. Wow. sorry I had a whole pizza all packed into this bag now by the time I had actually packed some water which was actually frozen by the time I got it out of the freezer I thought I was gonna put it in there just for 10 minutes and forgot all about it my bag weighed the same as a small child. So if you imagine a toddler on oh, my back no. and I'm cycling 100 miles, but I weren't hungry, but it just made me think, what an idiot. Who actually <laughs> packs like Dick Whittington? Like I'm going on some kind of like picnic. Who packs right. full starter? <laughs> who, 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 who packs full main course? And who packs dessert? No one. <laughs> You packed dessert? Wait a minute. <laughs> That's hilarious. You were like, I'm going to need me a snack. I'm going to need me a cheesecake. Like, you just had everything ready. Poor yeah, thing. Yeah, but think about how ill thought out that was. I had to actually ferry that through the majority of the 100 miles. So not only did I have a painful ride, but I had 
the equivalent, I, I, I swear to you, it was the equivalent of carrying a small toddler on my back as well. Not the brightest and not my finest moment. But you know what? You made it, Michael, and you raised a lot of money for a hell of a cause, even though you made things a bit more difficult with your, <laughs> with your, your <laughs> snacks and your meals. Jesus. But, you know, you learn for next time. And you did well. I'm well, proud of you. You know what I should have packed? You know? Some cornbread. Because <laughs> I right, wouldn't have yes. eaten that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. You wouldn't have even reached for it. You just would have yeah. been like, let me get this over with so I can get me a real, <laughs> exactly. some biscuits. <laughs> Exactly. How about your weekend? I mean, obviously you had you took in fights, but that was the sum total of my weekend. Obviously, like yourself, fights. But what did you get up to over the weekend? Oh, I, I headed over to um, New Jersey and saw my uh, UFC fight live and in person in my floor seats. It was wonderful. Oh, nice, nice. Which I suppose neatly segues into this episode. We're going to be taking a very quick look at UFC on ESPN Five. We've also got a special guest. Again, I did say that we'd be talking about Prospect Apparel. Part owner of Prospect Apparel, Nathaniel Wood, will be joining us later. And we'll also be having a very quick canter through Fight Night 156 this coming Saturday. But over to UFC on ESPN5. I have to say, I have to admit, the rest of the card did not float my boat. Like I mentioned last week, for me, it was the main and co-main event. And, um, I think your boy, old Mike, got his uh, got his pick right in the Jim Miller and Clay Guida matchup. Yeah. Oh yeah, you you did well. We both did well. I think we both picked him. I I didn't think Clay was gonna be able to get it done, especially after going three rounds with B J Penn. I was like, I think I'm gonna go with Jim. But um yeah, and but what surprised me was how quickly he got it done. I have to say that I didn't see a sub coming. I, I, I think I mentioned that he'd be starched, um, Clay Guida would be starched um, by Jim Miller. I did not see that sub coming, but they came out fast and furious and they came out, you know, throwing some serious bombs. And from what I saw, Clay Guida is still in there. He is definitely um, a long way away from retirement, given how, well, given his veteran status. I, I have to say, hats off to him. He looked pretty impressive. Oh, yeah, I agree with you because um, Clay Guida got a um, jump in. He was the one that I believe dropped Jim in the first round with a nice straight right that kind of had Jim on a uh, front street, had him doing the little stanky leg, but he um, got himself together and returned the favor and um, dropped Clay, and that's how he was able to get that guillotine. So it just, to me, I wanted to see more, you know, because I know that as um, the fight progresses, Jim Miller tends to slow down, and Clay Guida never does, so I was waiting for that type of contention for the fight, you know, and who was going to be um, more resilient, whether Clay's gas tank was going to prevail or whether Jim's, you know, being this veteran that's really tough was going to just, even though his gas tank was running out of gas, mm. but that didn't happen. It just, first round, they, they clocked each other, then Jim got the better hand, and then poor Herb Dean, again, folks were complaining online that he took a little bit too long now, for I, him to check on Clay. I don't you know, uh, someone based on their name, but Herb Dean... I, I'm not trying to be funny. I, I really am not doing this for comedic effect, but does he smoke herb? <laughs> because that reaction time, it was like someone was watching the fight through a foggy haze or after they just taking a puff of the big one. Because, okay, <laughs> given that, you know, his vantage point, obviously he couldn't see the tap, but he was feeling whether um, Clay Guida was still in the fight. He was feeling whether he was still conscious. And I thought on the second time of feeling, he, 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 looked, he looked as though, you know, he'd acknowledged that he was out, but he still kept, basically kept his distance as in, you know, he wasn't doing anything about the fact. Yeah, it's like, how many times are you going to grab his hand and shake it and not realize that the guy is just, you know, he's comatose, he's out of here, you know what I mean? Or is it just like, is he still tripping off Aspen Lad and GDR? Is he just really going to make sure these guys are flatlined and make sure it's not an early stoppage? Like, is he going from one extreme to another? Because even from my seat, I was like, he's out. And the crowd was saying it. They're like, Herb, he's out, he's out. Like, okay, enough, stop shaking his hand, he's gone. You know what I mean? So, I don't know, Herb, Herb um, I do feel like, um, refs, though, sometimes should either tweet something or have discussions about it because I feel like we discuss it, but we really don't know their angle of things. 
Well, you see, that's why I've got ultimate respect for someone like Mark Goddard. He'll come on a podcast and he'll explain because, you know, he's coming from a place of utmost professionalism and not only that, transparency. He'll either come on a podcast, explain or go on Twitter and walk you through exactly how and why he made that call. Not that he does owe us anything but I like his transparency and I would like to see the same from Herb to be honest with you I'd like to see the same from all reps again I've got to re-emphasize the fact that look their vantage point is different from what we can see but okay break that down tell us what we missed yeah and uh, and also you have to realize too that um, I'm sure you know this and I know this but it's a really hard job it's easy for us to sit on the couch or sit in the stands and be like hey Herbie's out even though Herb's closer and stuff like that it's still a difficult job and he's responsible for their safety and whatnot and he's also responsible for the fact that the fight has to be fair and square and the fighter has to be out or tap he can't just cause these early stoppages as well so you know he's got a really difficult job you know and he also has to keep biases and whatever stuff we've said about him in the past and just really focus on this one fight he can't sit and think about Aspen Ladd when he's working on the next fight you know and that's tough that's a tough job 100% considering what time this started ah oh, this was such a joy to behold I know the two words don't actually go together usually with Colby Covington but his performance was masterful I mean really and truly his pace his work rate his cardio was absolutely immense, so much so that he pressured. I mean, look where Robbie Lawler's actually come from. Look who he's for. He's, I mean, basically gone through and uh, clashed the who's who in terms of those who are actually in his weight division. And, you know, in certain cases, he's annihilated them. But Colby Covington, I have to say, made him look ordinary. Oh, I'd have to agree with you. And I think... Um... I think we need to give Colby Covington more props than people are giving him. I think it's, I don't, a lot of people are like, oh, something was wrong with Robbie. And I'm like, I don't think there was anything wrong with Robbie. I think Colby was that good. I think when somebody's output is, is, is tremendous. And then on top of that, you have to deal with his um, chain wrestling, which is setting up all these kicks, jabs, and punches, and wild hooks, and forcing someone to walk backwards towards the cage over and over again while taking away your energy is something that needs to be said and also Colby was non-stop he didn't get tired I think maybe his mouth started to open by the fifth round but he did not stop coming forward and 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 going forward with this chain wrestling and slapping Robbie up it was crazy I think he broke records Michael you know I I heard it was one of the well it was he, he did break the record in terms of the most strikes thrown in the octagon. Yeah, I believe he broke the record for, I think, like significant strikes. He had like 510, and then um, for total strikes, he had like 533, and it's both of them are UFC records, which is nuts. And in between the, in between breaking records, Michael, this, he had time to take um, Robbie Lawler down 10 times, and let's not forget Robbie is a wrestler. So this is just incredible. And in, and it wasn't just the fight. Being that I was there, Michael, just like from the walkout song, which was some famous WWE song that I've never heard of, but had me screaming, you suck, to, to Kobe Covington. It was great. Um, the atmosphere was live. Although I don't support Trump, his supporters were there, which made it kind of like, you know, good versus bad. And it was just like a lot of fun. Like um, all of that charisma and drama that he... Um, Um, you know, he brings to the table, he brought it to the fight as well, even with his post-fight antics and whatnot. It was fun. I just had, I had a good time, even though I'm not a fan of his, he brought it. It's just the post-fight antics that left a real sour taste in my mouth. Here was me getting to a point where I was thinking, you cannot disrespect his performance, even though you may hate the man, you've got to rate the man for what he actually brought to the table. And considering how he actually dealt with Robbie Lawler but it was the post-fight antics it was the post-fight uh, comment about Matt Hughes that really left a bad taste in my mouth but it made me think considering you know it was said in bad taste are we going to censor people on what they actually say are, are we going to have limits are we going to have lines that we say you can't actually cross this because there's two ways of actually looking at this He basically is pushing the envelope regardless of 
who he's talking to and what he's talking about. I personally don't feel that, you know, for people who are going to, you know, allow another fighter to talk about, you know, saying in, um, for example, Conor McGregor's references to Khabib and his family and, you know, to a certain extent, his religion. Um, we can't start censoring fighters, you know, just because, you know, they are venturing too close to the bone. I mean, what's your thoughts on it? I, I, I think you can't do anything about it. You know, I think that trash talking is historical and you can't really police it. Trash talking is a part of combat sports from Muhammad Ali to Colby Covington. And let's not forget that these people fight in a cage for a living. So things are going to get a little ugly. However, I do think that some things are uncalled for. I found the, the controversy between Khabib and Conor McGregor just out of line. But I don't think that the UFC should have some type of moral ethics type of code because how do you enforce that? And also, won't favoritism play a part in this? And also, self-promoting. You're going to put a line on self-promoting? It's just, it's just going to be too hard of a task to, to tackle. But I did feel like the post-fight speech about Matt Hughes was distasteful. But I think this is the, the world that we live in right now when it comes to combat sports. Everybody is self-promoting. And even if you heard the actual comment, I could tell that he had rehearsed it too. So it made it not only distasteful, but very corny. You, you couldn't even think about it on the top of your head and, and have us like, oh, no, you, you rehearsed it. It was so corny. But, you know, as well as that, it's funny you mentioned um, ethics and, you know, policing ethics in the UFC. I'm sure that used to be Matt Hughes' job. Now, when you look a little bit deeper into Matt Hughes' background outside of the cage, you know, beating up his wife, beating up, I think it was either his father-in-law or his dad. Yes, his father. Now, cheating on his wife. Now, I'm not going to sit here in judgment, but... It's not as though, you know, Colby Covington was dissing Mother Teresa now, is it? No, I mean, I mean, I think that's why, although I thought the comments was distasteful, I was not offended or triggered by it. I know some people that were really upset by it. I personally thought one garbage person was talking about another garbage person, so I wasn't <laughs> offended. That's how, in real talk, I wasn't offended. It was just like two people that I don't like that are both crass and gross and distasteful. One is fake, one is legitimately probably like a sociopath. I was not too, I wasn't offended. In fact, I felt bad for Robbie, and I was like, damn, like he's talking shit about his friend. I wonder if that affects Robbie. Come to find out after the fight, I believe Robbie was just like, this is the name of the game now. This is what people do. And I think fighters are becoming accustomed to people like Kobe Covington, believe it or not. I think behind the scenes, they know that person rehearsed that line and just made that up for controversy. He doesn't mean that. So I don't think Robbie took offense to it. You know, he's not Masvidal. <laughs> <laughs> I think now is an opportune time to take the moral high ground and speak to somebody who is a little bit on a, on a, on a higher level, and that is this week's guest, which is Nathaniel the Prospect Wood. How's it going? You tell me, man. It's about you right now. It is all about you. And, um, you know, before we go any further, let, let's just, let's, let's just uh, address the elephant in the room. The Prospect. When are we going to see this name actually be removed? And let's, why don't we just call you the future? I don't know, mate. I don't know. I think I need a UFC title sitting on my shelf first before I think about changing it. Um, I know it's usually for young, younger generation, more up-and-coming fighters. But if I'm honest, I like, I like the sound of it. I can't think of another nickname. So... Unless someone can think of one for me, I think for now I'm just going to have to stick with the prospect. <laughs> I think it would mess up your brand that you've obviously invested a lot of time and effort in. And uh, thank you again for sponsoring the show. I mean, just on that brand, I mean, considering that we have got you on the show, what was the inspiration behind the brand itself? Why now? Why the Prospect Apparel brand coming out now? If I'm honest, mate... A lot of it for me, I'm one of these people that I can't just sit around and do nothing all day. You know, I know a lot of people like to sit on the sofa, watch hours of TV, and I just can't. And 
with the sport that I'm in, I obviously do a couple sessions a day, which, you know, if we add it up, it's about four hours. That leaves another 20 hours in the day where I'm sitting around with not much to do. And I actually met one of my friends from a long time ago who set up a website for me, for just me and my fighting. And he said to me, he said, oh, mate, you know, you should, um, the fight t-shirts you do, you know, you should, you make a little brand. And I just sort of said to him, well, I have got the hours in the day to kind of put my mind to something and get something going. But I, I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of the computers and all of that side of thing. And, you know, I said to him, if you come on board with me, mate, we'll do it. So, yeah, literally, that was kind of how it all came about. And... Obviously, I've got to play it smart in this game. I know that fighting doesn't last forever and I don't want to be one of these fighters where come the end of my um, career, I'm just fighting for money. So if I can set things up in the meanwhile and plant these seeds now and, you know, potentially can can make a living off it, then when it comes to me retiring, I'd like it to be because I've had enough of the sport and not, you know, just down to money. Um so yeah, I'm just trying to just trying to be clever with it, and you know, if I can set something up now, and you know, within the next sort of ten years of me competing, can build something up, and then if not, you know, it's been fun while doing it anyway. Um, yeah, so that's that's really all that there is in terms of that, and with obviously the the name prospects, um, you know, I want a brand that can kind of focus on up and comers in sports whatever their field may be whether it's sport whether it's i don't know it could be anything in the world you know i want to be able to kind of represent the up and comers and so far we've got a couple of athletes that we're actually sponsoring um we've got one guy jordan muir who i'm good friends with and he's a really good up and comer just that his first amateur fight and it's nice to be able to sponsor some of these guys when i know most people in their amateur days don't don't have any sponsors and you know it's nice to be able to kit him out in my own clothing brand incredible so in terms of the future for um nathaniel wood is this going to be one of many things that you're actually branching into to ensure that you know you've got longevity after you know um fight life or are you just sticking with this for the moment no this is something i would definitely like to kind of pursue um as I say, it was easier for me to go on board with one of my friends because he's been a massive help and obviously it, it, it costs a lot of money doing this sort of stuff and, you know, it's nice to have someone else on board with me. Um, but there's definitely a few other ideas that I want to get going when I've got a little bit more money to my name, so I need a few more bonuses first. But, you know, I'm, in, I'm into my business, you know, I'm into the... I wouldn't say I'm an entrepreneur, but I've kind of, maybe if I wasn't fighting, I would be. Um, you know, I've always watched Dragon's Den and them sort of things when I'm a kid. And, you know, I definitely feel that I would like to work for myself. I'd never like to have to answer to people as a boss as such. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that job now in MMA and, you know, I'm loving every minute of it. But I just, I would hate to be fighting and competing at the end of my career just for money. So if I can set these things up now whilst I'm whilst I'm earning money doing what I love, then when it comes to the time where I'm like, you know, I've had enough of the sport, I can just hang my gloves up and not worry about, you know, how much I'm going to earn every month. That I hear. Just before I, I hand over to G to get her first question in, I know she's chomping at the bit to ask. Um, I'm, I'm, again, just trying to make sure that our international audiences know why we haven't seen you in the cage. I obviously know why we haven't actually uh, seen or heard from you. What exactly is going on with Nathaniel the Prospect Wood and why aren't you, um, well, <laughs> why aren't you in action? Yeah, well, I actually, after my last fight, I went travelling with my now fiancé, um, for six weeks, you know, went and done a bit of traveling around the world, which was amazing. You know, it's definitely experience, an experience I've always wanted to do. And, you know, I thought now's the time to quickly do it before, you know, I settle down too much. And, uh, you know, obviously it'll be hard to do them sort of things when, you know, got kids on the way and got mortgages to pay and stuff. So done that, came back and, you know, a few weeks into my training, looking like I'm getting a fight booked up soon. I end up dislocating my arm. Um, you know, I landed on it in a real awkward position and it went all floppy and the wrong way. Um, 
And unfortunately, I actually found out yesterday, because I've gone private now, I wanted to speed things up, that I have actually broken it. I've torn oh. a ligament. Um, I've got pieces of bone floating around in there. And yeah, so it cost me another, and a bit more money than I wanted to pay. Um, so yeah, none of that was good news as such. The doctor did say that he'd like to operate, but he said that it's not a necessity. You know, he said that potentially I could carry on. It's been fixing up nicely and you know, I'm getting more movement in it. The pain's dying down. So we're going to see how it is with another month. And then hopefully I'll avoid operation for now and just get back to training. Um, he said it's a bit of a guessing game at the moment. A lot of people are different, so only time will tell how it's going to be. But I've got a, um, I've got a sports therapist that's with me at the moment called Umut, who's who's working with me. So he's been treating me literally every day. And you know, as I say, I had my cast off a week ago, and already I feel, you know, ten times better than when it came off. Um, so yeah, it's a setback, but you know they say every setback is for a comeback. Hey Nathaniel, I had a question in reference to the UFC, being that I'm a huge UFC head, and I noticed that you have um, had fights in Cage Warriors, Bellator, Bama, and everyone often says that the um, the hardest competitors and the best competition in the world is in the UFC, and being that you fought in so many different places. Is that true? Did, is competition a bit harder in the UFC in comparison to your other organization? Yes, I would definitely say the competition is higher. You know, the fighters are a lot more skillful. You know, they have a lot more credentials. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. However, in this sport, I, a lot of people may disagree, but I think it is a game of luck. You know, we are competing against the best in the world. Anyone in this sport from, you know, even the cage warriors level above has the ability to knock someone out. They have the ability to submit someone. And in this sport, you know, you can lose in so many different ways, whether it be disqualification, yes. whether it yeah. be, you know, you get injured during the fight. So even though, you know, I'm fighting these guys, I don't feel that the fights have necessarily been any harder. Um, and, you know, I believe that you know, I could go back on Cage Warriors now and have one of the toughest fights there is. And I actually did have the toughest fight of my life on Cage Warriors. Who was your hardest component, um, sc component, excuse me, your hardest opponent in um, Cage Warriors that piqued my interest? Josh Reed gave me the toughest fight. You know, I don't believe he was the, t the toughest opponent I've come up against. But that fight, you know, was the toughest one I've had. He caught me with some good shots, um, had my brain rattled. And, you know, luckily I came back from it. Um, but yeah, you know, that one, that was one the most damage. Um, when it comes to fighters, I've always wanted to ask this question because I, I see it a lot online and, you know, a lot of us are just fans. We're not fighters. And a lot of us have like these dumbass opinions. So I'm always like, you know what? One day I'm going to ask a real fighter this question. Do fighters ever literally get scared of their opponents? Because online, that's all they, t oh, he's scared. He dodged this person. He, you know, he didn't want to fight this person. Is he scared? And I just always want to ask a fighter, do, are y'all ever really scared of an opponent? I've never been personally scared of an opponent as such. Um, I believe there are fighters out there that will avoid to fight certain people because certain, certain fighters are a bad style matchup for people. Ooh. You know, so if someone's mm. really bad on the ground, they would maybe try to avoid a, you know, a black belt in jiu-jitsu or, or whatnot. But I don't know any personally that have been scared. Um, especially in the UFC level, you know, I think once you get to the UFC, you fight whoever they give you. And if you're not confident in who you're fighting, then I think mm -hmm. you're in the sport. So, you know, I, I believe that whoever whoever's in the UFC, they believe in their head that they're the best in the world and should fight the best in the world. And, you know, if you're avoiding people at this level, then, you know, you're not, to me, going to get very far in this game. There are definitely, say, in the semi-pro and early pro um, fights, of course, there will be opponents. Even me, if I was a coach, I might say to my fighter, you know, you're not ready for this guy yet, so we're not going to put you in. Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily scared of the opponent. That's more, you know, we, we don't think this is a good matchup for you. As I say, unless you're fighting absolute 
bums, you know, I don't think you're ever going to get a guaranteed win in this sport. So, you know, for me, it's, I always say that I fight whoever the show gives me unless my coach says otherwise. It's funny that you mentioned, uh, Nathaniel, um, Cage Warriors, Cage Warriors in particular and the difficult opponents in Cage Warriors, that being, you know, a, um, well, highly respected uh, regional promotion. But one of the new signees to the UFC is Jack Shaw, who, when you and he shared the roster on Cage Warriors, a lot of people were looking forward, rubbing their hands with glee so that they could actually see you clash. Now, the fact is, he's now in the UFC. Is that a fight that you actually want to see happen? Or do you feel as though you're, you're levels above him now? Um... It's definitely, for me, as I say, mate, um, I will fight anyone there is in the UFC. You know, as long as I'm getting paid, which I am, then, you know, I'm happy to fight whoever they give me tomorrow. If they want to offer me, you know, TJ Dillashaw, so be it. If they want to offer me Jack Shaw, so be it. Um, I, However, I don't think they will because, you know, I'm 3-0 and in the UFC now with three finishes. So I would have thought they would want to kind of give me more of a top top 15 or top 10 guy. Um but obviously, if Jack proves himself, you know, and gets a, gets a couple of fights, I'm sure that's a, something that can happen. Um, is it a fight? I'm not, you know, I've got no issue with the guy. So it's not like I'm sitting there going, I want to fight Jack Shaw. I don't feel he does anything for me, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, I'd, I'd much rather fight someone like Cody Garbrandt, who has, you know, a million followers and a lot more attention going for him. Um but sure, you know, if, if uh, Sean Shelby come up to me tomorrow and said, mate, I want you to fight Jack Shaw, then yep, yeah, let's get it on. You know, I'll be down for that. And just on opponents, uh, I know, obviously, right now, you're not really in a situation to start calling on opponents or possibly calling them out, which I know that's not your style. But I know a while back you had your top five list of opponents and they were basically people who had clashed Brad Pickett have you looked or have you gone past that list now or is that still on your list of things to do um it's kind of and kind of hasn't you know obviously uh Renan Burrell has not been doing too well so you know that for me would be a backstep fight um but you know it would always make good fun to be fighting someone that's beating my coach you know there's nothing personal there I just that something about that just excites me you know I feel like it's it's almost like a movie, you know, it's like the student avenges his, uh, his master. So for me, you know, I think that would be exciting. It would be something fun to train for. And I think it would sell tickets, you know, people that are coming to watch the fight. It has a bit more to it. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'd definitely like to fight um, Chito Vera. You know, he, he beat my coach. So, you know, I'd like to avenge that loss. Someone like Eddie Wineland, you know, he beat, um, beat Brad, my coach as well. But... They've got, I think Eddie Wineland's a legend in the sport. I was watching him back in the WEC days. So for me, you know, I'd love to have a have a scrap with them. Um, but yeah, you know, as I say, I'm not I'm not asking for it. As far as I'm concerned, I'm still quite early on in the UFC. So for me, I don't think I'm in a position to call out people or turn people down. So you know, whoever the UFC want to give me, um, I definitely would like to start working my way up the rankings and. You know, if I could get another fight before the next London card, it would be cool if I could be the main event for that. I love the way, Nathaniel, from start to finish, from the time I've known you, you've been loyal to the people around you and especially um, to your coach. Brad Pickett recently started up um, British Top Team. Now, I know that you've neatly segued away from Team Titan. How difficult a decision was that, considering that Team Titan is a staple part of, well, basically, your journey. Um, obviously, Team Titan's been my gym that I've gone to. Um, but we have a team in a team as such. So, Team Titan's the hub, you know. That was the gym that we all trained at. Obviously, my head coach, Brad Pickett, all my training partners, they were all there. Um, since then, you know, for sort of reasons I'm not even really too involved with, it's kind of the team separated as such. So I've just chose to, you know, stick with the people that I was mainly training with. So obviously that's Brad Pickett, Ashley Grimshaw, who's my jiu-jitsu coach. You know, there's a lot of my close sparring partners that uh, are now left with the gym as such. But the, the problem is with Team Titan is it's very far for us. It was about an hour and a half journey. So we would do an hour and a half there, train, then an hour and a half back. So, you know, it was never the most ideal place to go. Um, you know, and I've always been loyal with Brad 
Brad. He's um, he's the guy that took me up to it, and you know, I went there for him. In a way, the names changed, but I'm still training with all the people that I was still training with at Team Titan. Oh, so does that mean that? Um... Does that mean that uh, Nathan Grayson, for example, is moving over to British top team? I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, I haven't I haven't much seen much of the guys because you know I was away travelling. I got back, was doing a bit of training, and then I, you know, I'm injured again. So I've been out of the gym, unfortunately. Um, I've still been getting some certain things in, like my cardio and whatnot, just to stay ticking over. But I haven't seen Nathan since he's lost on Bellator. Um, so I'm not sure what the, the latest is. You know, I know some of the guys were still going down Team Titan as well. Because um, some of the guys, they live closer to the gym. So, you know, for me, obviously, it's very far to get to. But I know a lot of the guys are going to stay with GBTT and Team Titan. Um, you know, there's no drama as such. It's just, I think... It just came to a time where Brad's going to kind of do his own thing. Um, but yeah, you know, everyone's on good terms and stuff. So, you know, Nathan Grayson, I've, I've been training with for years. So, you know, I'm not sure I'd have to speak to my manager and stuff where, when he's next fighting and stuff. But, you know, 100% when my arm's getting better, I'll, I'll be training with the same guys that I've, that I've always stuck with. I really thought, Nathaniel, that there was some beef. And I was really hoping that there would be some kind of, in the future, obviously, um, GB top team versus Titan, but um, are you telling me that's definitely not on the cards? Ah, oh, that's yeah, that's definitely not on the cards, mate. Unfortunately, I hate to burst your bubble there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, G, did you want to jump in there? No, I was holding my breath, waiting for the response. I was really hoping that you would get what you wanted, Michael. <laughs> I just wanted to know, what do you think of the like the entertainment aspect of the UFC? Like, should we expect you to start like self promoting and maybe coming out of character a little bit? Is that something that crosses your mind now that you fight in the UFC? Um, definitely not from my side of things. Um, you know, I'm very uh, what do they say? As as real as it gets. You know, what you see is what, what you get with me. Um, but this is the thing: a lot of people need to sell fights because they don't entertain when they actually fight you know there's a lot of fighters that are very boring as let's say so the only kind of way of them getting the limelight is by talking trash you know acting mm -hmm, up mm -hmm. being just embarrassing as far as i'm concerned um yes, sir. Yes, sir. and so many fighters are doing that now but i feel that i'm actually getting more attention just being myself you know i want to be known as a humble guy you know, look, if you go to boxing, look at Ricky Hatton, you know, look at the support he gets. And mm -hmm, all he mm -hmm. was was he was just himself. And, you know, I think since McGregor came in and made a lot of money by, you know, doing his trash talking and selling yeah, the fights, yeah. I feel every fighter is doing that now. And it's very, yeah, to me, it's very bland now. You know, when everyone's doing the same thing, it's right. just, it becomes boring. So, you know, I'm just being myself, oh, being the sort yeah. of the normal guy that I am. And I feel like I'm getting, you know, a lot of attention for that. And... You know, it's nice to see, you know, I'm not, I've not really got any haters or anything like that. And, you know, I've got a lot more followers than certain fighters in the UFC on, on my Instagram that have been in there a lot longer than me. So, you know, I feel like I'm doing something right, at least. There is a flip side to that, what you just said there, though, you know, Nathaniel. And I have to say, you know, hats off to you for being the same Nathaniel Wood that I met in 2011. You haven't changed one bit. But in terms of your future career, you'll know that this is part entertainment. You'll know that the squeakiest hinge gets the grease. So do you feel in the future that possibly you're going to have to speak up if you want to get the fights that you want? Um, no, you know, I honestly would just say my honest opinion. So, you know, there's no fighters as such that I dislike. You know, if, for example, obviously Henry Cejudo is the guy that I've got to fight for the belt, when I believe that I'm in the, the position to call for that fight, you know, you best believe I'll be calling for it. But, you know, I won't be saying anything out of my character. You know, I won't be saying trash talking for no need of it. If if an opponent wants to trash talk with me, then, yeah, you know, you're going you're gonna to get a response from me. But at the moment, you know, I'm just kind of, doing my thing and it seems to be working so you know I, i'm never gonna put on a fake show you know i believe that my fights are entertaining 
you know, I, I'm going to say it how it is. And if I dislike a fighter and, you know, I think there's something about them, you know, you best believe that I'm going to say it. Um, but I'm not going to make stuff up for the sake of it because that's just not me. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter about, about the money and stuff. That's why, you know, hopefully if, if my clothing brand reaches millions, then, you know, I won't ever have to have to come out of character to, to earn the box. Ah, oh, for real. Just my final question, just before I um, hand over to G, if she wants to have a closing um, burning issue uh, answered. But, you know, out of all your losses, no disrespect to anybody that you fought, but looking at your, your losses, I would say you are levels above them. I I'm talking like serious levels above them now. Looking back at those, are there any, or if there was one fight that you'd want to run back, which would be that fight? In a way, every one of them. Um, every one of them I've technically got excuses for as to why I lost. You know, I had issues going on with the Ed Arthur fight, the Alan Philpott fight. You know, I disagree with the how the, the doctors came in and said they had to stop the fight because I had a broken nose. Like, who cares? And the Mike Cohen fight, you know, I just, if I'm honest, I just forgot about arm bars for a second and he got one um i believe all of them fights you know if, if they were replayed i would win um but again that comes to the you know as i said earlier that a lot of it's a flip of a coin you know in this sport if you make a mistake that's it you know you don't get another another shot unless you get a rematch so you know i'd, I'd love to replay them all um if it was you know in the ufc and getting paid good money for it i hear you I just wanted to thank you. Um, I, I've never said this to you before. I've covered you, as I mentioned, from 2011. You've allowed me to actually film backstage, up close and personal with you. You've allowed me to put out material which shows you crying. You've allowed me to show uh, people, basically the sensitive side, the other side of the cage, which people don't actually get to see. Things like you actually losing your temper because they had actually stopped um, the Alan Philpott. Um, fight. So I just wanted to thank you again for allowing me such close access, but for again just being yourself. So thank you for that. Uh, mate, you're welcome. And as I say, you know, it's it's nice to just be myself. And you know, whether it's people seeing footage of me crying backstage because I've lost or whatnot, you know, I, I don't care. That's that's me. And you know, what you see is what you get. And you know, I'm happy for for that sort of footage to go out and. Obviously, you're, you've been covering the sport for a long time, mate, and it's a pleasure to have you still kind of covering my side of things. Oh, thank you, bro. I really do appreciate that. Anytime, I mean it. <laughs> Gee, one final question. Oh, man, I was feeling the love. I'm sorry, I got distracted. So sweet. Um, question. Let's discuss Henry Cejudo. Um, Nathaniel, what are your thoughts on him? Like. Tell me some good things. Tell me some pros, cons. And do you think you match up well with him if, let's say, hypothetically, you were ready for him? Yeah, obviously, the guy is, as we say, the best in the world at the moment at bantamweight and flyweight. You know, I can't knock him. He's obviously a skillful fighter. Um, if I'm honest, he's the most cringy guy I've ever... You know, <laughs> I just I can't I can't deal with the, the, the cringiness, you know, Um the, the stuff when he came on stage with TJ and was slapping a toy snake and the, the, the triple champ and it's just it's one of those it's one of those things you know what I just said I wouldn't do I wouldn't come out and put on this fake kind of persona um, and that's what I believe he's doing you know I don't know what his paychecks like and whether he's getting paid more money for it I don't know but for me you know it's just yeah it's cringy. Um, I'd love to fight him, you know. Obviously, he's the champ. He's got the belt, so he's the one that I'm kind of aiming for right now. Um, I think I'd ma I think I'd match up very well against him, you know. Um, yeah, I believe that, that. I believe that I'd knock him out. So, obviously, a lot of people may laugh at that, but that's you know, we'll only we'll only time will tell if we get matched up. Exactly, and I'm not laughing at all. And I hope you get the job done when the opportunity sees fit. Because I've had about enough of the cringe, too. So. <laughs> well, thank you and good luck to you in your career. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, You're Nathaniel. Welcome. It's been amazing speaking to you as always. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me on. Appreciate it. I have to say, that's one of the most genuine and um, realist uh, guests that we've had 
on the podcast, on the Wocast so far. I really have got a lot of time for Nathaniel Wood. So let's neatly segue into this coming weekend, which is Fight Night 156. Again, um, I'm not going to make any bones about this. This card is terrible. Uh, I I can understand why. For yeah. me, the standouts are Valentina Shevchenko and Liz Carmouche and Mike Perry. Mike Perry faces Vincente Luque. Now, in terms of people on the card um, that you are actually going to be looking out for, I mean, below those, uh, is, there, is there any particular thing that floats your boat? Or yeah, there's, kind of, you can't there's one. See? I'm intrigued. I wouldn't say that I'm like pumping my chest to see it, but I am going to sit up straight and mm. keep an eye on this because it's uh, number seven ranked Vul- um, Vulcan Ozdemir and Alir L- yeah, oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Latifi. Latifi, I yeah. completely forgot about that. I, 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 I have to beg your pardon. Well, that's, that's what you got me right. for. That you know, I'm good for something <laughs> here. <laughs> so you got me, and um, yeah, because they're also closely ranked. You know, this fight was supposed to. I can't remember which card it was on, but I believe they scraped it at the last minute. There was an issue. They've been trying to fight each other for a while, and mm. it's back on. And I think it's going to be a pretty decent fight. Um, we know Alir is another one. He goes hard and, <laughs> and he swings like a tank and he hits pretty hard. And Vol- Volcan is pretty um, well-rounded. He's dangerous on the ground and his hands are heavy. So I'm really intrigued by this matchup. And they're evenly matched and close in ranking, seven and number nine. So it's gonna s- we're going to see who moves up from here and, and continues to um, fight mm. for the title. So to both these men, this fight is kind of important. Oh, 100%. And in terms of your picks for the co-main and main event i'm going with my man mike perry to do the business against vincente oh, luke okay well um i beg to differ i think uh luke is gonna get vincent luke is gonna get it done i think um he's uh underrated i think he's really tough and he has a he has a ton of experience if you look at his um fight history he's got a ton of fights mm. a ton of wins and he's he's pretty damn tough. I mean, he put out Brian Barberina at the last second at you know ESPN one Nagano versus Velasquez, and it was a it was such a fun fight. And he put him down at the last second. He's resilient. Do you know what I mean? Chad Laprise KO. Yeah, I know exactly. What he's. You mean. I think he's just. I think he's underrated. I think people don't really pay too much attention to him. I think he's a sleeper. I think he's gonna knock him out too. You see that? That's why. I mean, in terms of finishes, I, I was gonna say that I would go for Mike Perry with a knockout only because his aggressive come forward style the fact is he comes out and he swings and he swings big and once he connects if he can touch you you're going out I do agree with that the man uh, Mike Perry has enormous power in his hands but I just think I Mm. just think the veteran experience that most uh, fans and most people are not aware of what Luque is going to to be why he wins I think Honestly, I think he's a better fighter than Mike Perry. I think Mike Perry is still learning. That's why he's at um, Jackson's right now. As you can see, he's like, he's still learning. You saw in the Cowboy fight, he went for a takedown. Why? Because he's still learning. He, want, <laughs> he wanted to implement that. You know, and I don't blame him for it. See, Vincent, I don't think he's, he's going to know what to do. He didn't switch camps and now has a new trainer and is trying to, you know, get better at this. He's, he's good to go. And he's got the experience. So I'm going to put my money on um, Vincent for the co-main. And for the main event, of course, I'm going to go with the bullet, Valentina. Yeah, well, for once in a very long time, you and I are agreeing on exactly the same. Valentina Shevchenko, I have to say, she is formidable. I would, you know, I, I would bet good money on it that she's going to be coming away with the victory. I mean... This Carmouche, for me, I mean, no disrespect, it's going to be like lamps in the slaughter. Oh, yeah, and I think this is their second fight, and I believe um, Liz Carmouche won the first time from Dr. Stoppage. And I'm not going to say it was like Mm. a lucky blow or anything, but I just don't think that's going to happen again. I think since their first fight, Valentina has improved in front of our eyes with, with herself, with her team, and she's had some wars. And Liz Carmouche, I mean, we've seen her win, you know, recently. And But not really. We haven't seen the advancements that we've seen in Valentina. She's grown to become the champ. She's fought Amanda Nunes. If you compare that to Liz Kamuch, 
uh, it doesn't really add up. So I think the better fighter is going to be Valentina, and I think she's going. I don't know if she's going to knock her out. I think maybe a decision. I think Liz is going to put up a good fight, though. So I suppose that neatly segues into the final section of the show, and that is listener questions. I will admit this is kind of like my favorite part of the show. It's just because it's just like a hot <laughs> mess, you know. It's just it. <laughs> well, it's not. It's not. It's nice to interact with uh, the, you know the people who listen as well, and um, I like the real questions. I really do like the no holds barred uh, approach that people have who feel they can ask us anything, as, which is brilliant. As so do I, and it's like I talk to these people every day, so it's nice to put like a personality or like some you know to make it not so surreal. Do you know what I mean? Like these people are alive yeah. that I'm chatting to every yeah. day, so it's nice. Mm. So you ready? Mm. Okay, let's yep. uh, do one about the Robbie Lawler and Colby Covington. This is from Mayor Tufono, and he says, What do you think was wrong with Robbie? Was he gassed from all the extra muscle he was carrying on? Because I think he looked jacked and really big. So you think something was wrong with him, Mike? Definitely not. I think that would be taking something away, as I mentioned earlier, from Colby Covington's performance. It's just that Colby Covington was that good. He was basically keeping at the, him at the end of a jab. And when he wasn't at the end of the jab, he was taking a hook exactly. in the face. And when he wasn't taking, when he wasn't taking damage upstairs, he was being taken down to the ground. Now, you know, you can't take anything away from uh, Covington because of his cardio was definitely on point, which, you know, Really and truly, I think that was Robbie's downfall. I thought for a second there, you know what? He's waiting. He's saving mm -hmm. all of his energy until Covington's burnt out until the fifth round where you're going to see him throwing some bombs. Did not happen. It was a five-round shutout as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the game plan was to let Kobe wear himself out. And I don't believe... Hold, I, someone needs to hold me to this. Is this Kobe's first five-round war? Because the game plan might have been, oh, he's never been in a five-round fight. So, but I could be wrong. But I think they tried to, like, wear him out. And it just didn't happen because he didn't get tired. And, and Robbie was on the defensive. And it's really hard, too, to kind of keep up with all those strikes and then have someone just switch it up and take you to the ground. And now you're fighting off a rear naked choke. And I think anybody in that situation would be exhausted. And we also need to remember that Robbie is somewhat out of his prime, you know, and Kobe is not, he's in his prime. He's young and he has everything working for him. So kind of his performance was so good. It made Robbie look bad, but there was nothing wrong with him. You know? Oh, 100%. Um, if I remember rightly, this is his, it looks like it's his second um, five rounder. There you go. When he fought uh, Rafael de Sanjos, remember he took him to unanimous, unanimous oh, decision. Oh, okay, good. And um, so yeah, it's his second one. He was obviously later stripped. Yeah, he was later stripped of the title, but that was where he won the interim UFC welterweight championship. So yeah, this is his second go good. at uh, a Thank five rounder. Thank you for the fact and, um, Yeah, that's okay. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're good for something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good, because I, I was question? I was teetering on that, but you know I still think the game plan was to wear him out. But yes, you're right because when he fought for the interim title, he went five rounds. So yeah. Next question is from my man um, in Ireland. I love this kid. His name is Aaron Eastwood. Okay. He's he's a real nice kid. We chat all the time. Why are U.S. fans so slow to go to prelim fights? There is always few people at the early fights and zero atmosphere. And UF, UFC Newark being a prime example. And let me tell you something, Aaron. I was there, and myself and my friend were just looking around like, where is everybody? And I think it's absurd. Wow. I don't. Mike, have, have you experienced this? I know you've been to plenty of fights. Have you ever looked around and been like, what the fuck is going on? Um, it, it's funny that um, the listener is from Ireland because... They are famous for arriving before the first prelim because they want to catch every single fighter. I would say it's more of a US phenomenon. That's why he actually hit upon the fact that, you know, when it takes place overseas, it does tend to be really sparse. And I would say in the UK, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. there, are, there, there are people in attendance, but way more than they are 
when you look on screen in the US. So I would say it's more of a US phenomenon, hence the reason, you know, for that question directed, you know, to your, um, your fellow countrymen and women. Well, being that I am the U.S., you know, the state's person here, I've, I'm doing my best to answer it, but I, I honestly don't know what's wrong with um, U.S. MMA fans. But I did notice that every fight that I've been to, the mm. crowd only starts to fill up around the main event, which is nuts to me because I go when the first prelim starts. But I did notice, like, if when I go with my friends, a lot of them are not interested in the prelim fighters. And what I think is that a lot of viewers, some are casuals, believe it or not, that come to attend these events. And they don't want to see the guy who's having a UFC debut against another UFC d debut. They want to see the stars. And yeah. unfortunately, Americans can be, you know, somewhat lazy. They want the brand name. So what I notice is that when that main event or that co-main event starts... That's mm. when the seats start to fill up. But I think it's absurd being that I'm a hardcore fan. So, I you. yeah, so I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon to me, Mike. Okay. And you ready for the next one? As ready as I'll ever be. Perfect. This is from my homegirl. I love this girl. Very sweet girl. Ashley, the MMA nerd. Okay. And she, she has a question Doesn't about she this card. Does she have a podcast? Yes, she does. Is that, and same, it's, is that same MMA nerd? Yes, it's Ashley MMA Nurse. She does her own podcast, and I listen to it, and it's excellent. So if anybody's listening, oh, okay. go ahead and check that out. Um, she sent me a question today. She said, do you think that making Valentina Shashenko defend her title on an ESPN Plus card is disrespectful to her? No, because fighters fight, and if that is the scheduled slot that they have for her, now let, let's just be real here. In terms of brand value, in terms of attraction, and in terms of putting bums on the seats, Valentina Shevchenko ain't where it's at. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, they've actually pitched this accordingly. They've put it on a card, and they've put it in a slot, and they've put it in a location where basically, you know, they're trying to get as much value, brand value, as, you know, you could possibly um, entertain out of it. So I don't think it's disrespectful. I think it is, I, th I, I, would, I would look at this as just the UFC trying to get as much in terms of bang for their buck, in terms of bums on seats and in terms of interest as they mm. possibly can. But no way is this disrespectful. Yeah, and I, um, I don't think it's disrespectful, but a part of me is like, she is the champ. She's just coming off of like this glorious KO. Can we push her a bit more? Put maybe put this card, put this fight on a stronger card. I kind of see where Ashley's coming from with this question, but I also can see your point. Like, I, I feel like I can play devil's advocate with both folks. Like, I do feel like this is appropriate for ESPN Plus. This is a good name for a free card, like a good main event card. Like, yeah. I'm not complaining about this being on ESPN Plus, and it's a good main event but I think like Valentina can be promoted a bit more and I have an issue sometimes with the way the UFC kind of does not promote stars like this you know and she's coming off a beautiful head kick I think she, I think she's going to take Liz Carmouche you know out in a decision but I think it's going to be a good fight I think they could have put her as a co-main on maybe someone else's card but I'm not mad that it's free on and on ESPN plus and I don't think it's disrespectful but it raises another issue the UFC can do more for her Oh, 100%. Yeah. But as I say, they've pitched this accordingly. You know, let's be realistic as to, you know, the brand value at play here. Oh, yeah. And then, like you said, the card isn't, you know, all that jump in. It's, it's just, I mean, you know, I'm going to watch it. You know, I, you know, I watch every fight they, they have. And even I'm taking a look at the prelims right now. There's nothing really that jumps out at me. And it's just, just going to be a pretty decent card. Hopefully the fighters bring it and it's just like entertaining and they go to war, even though I'm not familiar with some of these fighters, you know? Mm, 100%. Yeah. Well, I'll keep you posted because you'll probably just pass out because, you know, you'll be up with your <laughs> eyes burning and stuff. So I got you, Mike. Well, that wraps up this episode of The Wocast. Be sure to follow us on social media. I am at Mike Wo TV. if you want to continue anything that you've heard in terms of discussion, debate and dialogue. And your Twitter handle? G from State Farm, as always, but be sure to be nice. <laughs> <laughs>
I like have I have post traumatic stress from dragging everybody. So please be nice. Well, if you can't be nice, make some trouble. Not always. Someone won't be nice. Don't worry.